time for our second hour to begin. And we were discussing the blessedness of suffering as a Christian from 1 Peter 4, verse 12 through 19. And we had, <coughs> had mentioned uh, in verse uh, 17 how that uh, the judgment of uh, was to begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel? That is, the judgment that is being discussed there is persecution uh, that the world brings uh, upon Christians. They have judged the world, uh, the world has judged Christians in relationship to what they are li doing and what they are living, what they are teaching. And they, as a result of that, uh, suffer persecution. Uh, and there's a contrast, though, of severity in relationship to here's what is happening. Here's the persecution that is bring, being brought upon Christians, what's happening to them, and that is a severe persecution that they were undergoing. However, what about those who do not obey the gospel? <clears throat> Uh, what about their situation? Well, the persecution or the affliction that is going to come upon them is going to be a much greater punishment than anything that the Christian would suffer. Uh, so they have a greater punishment that's going to come or a greater uh, persecution that's going to come upon them, uh, those who do not obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. And with that then, he says, And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and sinner appear? Again, this has uh, been used in times past, uh, or misused in times past, maybe you should say, as to teaching that uh, the difficulty of salvation, even for those who are Christians. Uh, but... Uh, that's not what is being spoken of. First, let's deal with the word righteous. Uh, that individual who is righteous is one who has obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. He's living according to God's word. First uh, John 3 and verse 7, He that does righteousness is righteous even as he is righteous. Uh, the righteous are the God's commandments are righteousness. 119th Psalm 172. <clears throat> And that righteousness of God is revealed in the gospel of Jesus Christ, Romans 1, 16 and 17. So here's the righteous, that one who is a faithful Christian and living in that faithfulness. Now, if uh, he is scarcely saved, their being sa scarcely saved is a salvation, uh, certainly, uh, that is being deal dealt with. Uh, but here is a salvation that is accomplished with great difficulty. Uh, this, <clears throat> this actually is a quote from the Septuagint translation of uh, Proverbs 11 and verse 31. But the salvation can refer to many different things. It does not have to refer to eternal salvation. Within the context here, uh, the salvation is not a salvation in heaven. Instead, it is a salvation from suffering, which is coming upon the Christians. Uh, in Second Peter 1 and verse 11, in fact, uh, we're told that we're given an abundant entrance into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So that would be contradictory to scarcely being saved or just barely or with difficulty being saved. No. This could not have reference to salvation in heaven. But, as we've been noticing all through First Peter, there was a great persecution that was coming upon the Christians. And such persecution, if you apply it this context to the destruction of Jerusalem and the persecutions that arise as a result of the, that, uh, Matthew 24 and verse 22, such persecution, uh, problems that uh, the world had never seen. And so what this is doing is reinforcing 
what verse 17 says, that uh, judgment must begin at the house of God. And in relationship to that physical punishment that you're going to be undergoing, the righteous are scarcely going to be saved. They're just barely going to be saved from this type of a persecution. But if that's the condition and the situation with man or with Christians in relationship to their physical salvation, what about from a spiritual standpoint in relationship to the ungodly and the sinner? Well, they're going to again, going back to verse 17, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of, our, of God? Well, they're going to be punished. They're going to, they're, the punishment that they endure and that they're going to suffer is going to be so far greater. And so where will the ungodly and sinner appear? The answer, they're not. They're going to be punished. They are going to suffer great uh, punishment uh, such as this world will never know. And so, verse 19, Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing, as unto a faithful creator. This shows that our view of verses 17 and 18 and regarding the salvation of those who are righteous and um, the judgment of, that will begin at the house of God is dealing with Christian or with suffering. Uh, those Christians who, who suffer and not their eternal destiny and the eternal salvation which they possess. These suffering Christians now commit their souls to God and they realize that God will protect, he will preserve their souls. The word commit that's found there, they commit the keeping of their souls to him, is the Greek word peritithemi. And it literally means to place or to put beside. And from that, you're placing it beside you, there's the aspect of entrusting it, delivering. You're placing this beside God. You're placing it at his footstep is the way we might express it. And so it is placing something into his trust that he is going to thus uh, deliver it. He's going to protect it. He is going to take care of it. Well, that's what Christians in suffering do. They commit their souls to him and realizing that he is a, a faithful creator. Now then, we come to the next major section, which is the close, closing admonitions, starting in chapter 5 and verse 1 and going through verse 11. In these closing admonitions, we first have some admonitions to elders, uh, chapter, four verses, or chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. Um, and we... The qualifications of elders are given in 1 Timothy 3, verses 1 through 7, and Titus 1, verses 5 through 14. Uh, there is to be a plurality of elders in each congregation, uh, as seen in Acts 24th, or Acts 14th chapter, in verse 23, and Acts 20th chapter, verses 17 through 28 and also Philippians 1 and verse 1 in the use of the plural term there. Uh, and we would remind everyone that in relationship to elders, uh, sometimes, and talking about plurality of elders, uh, there is, we are faced with an argument that goes something along the line, well, yes, we have to install a plurality of elders, but if uh, we only have two elders and one of them dies, then one can continue to serve as an elder by himself. Well, that's not the case. Uh, there has to be a plurality of elders in every congregation. Uh, <clears throat> wish we had time to really consider a lot of passages that deal with elders and the eldership, uh, but uh, obviously as behind as we are in our studies and getting through all of this material. Uh, it's just not time uh, that we can spend. But I would encourage you to study Hebrews 13, verse 7 and verse 17, 
uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 12 and verse 13, and Acts 20 and verse 28 uh, along these lines as well. Peter begins, The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. The word elder is from the Greek word presbyteros, and it very simply means older or aged. Here is one who is older. Here is one who is aged. Uh, it is used many times within the scriptures in relationship simply to the aspect of uh, someone who is older, age-wise. But it's also used as is being used here is to one who is in that official capacity of the work of the eldership and not used in that general term for one who is older. Here, obviously, it is someone who is within that office of the eldership or that work of the eldership in that specific use of the term as found in the New Testament and not in that general use of the term for simply one who is older. The exhortations that Peter is going to give are based on three qualifications that he has. And the first of those is that he is a fellow elder. And let me mention before we get into that, the, the two terms uh, that are used here, elders, plural, and now then he says elder, singular. Uh, when you're dealing with that work of the eldership uh, or that official capacity in, uh, of elders, it is always found in the plural within the New Testament, as it is seen here, the elders, plural. However, uh, Peter is able to use the term elder, who am also an elder, in the singular term, because he is talking about himself being a part of an eldership, uh, and thus he, separate from the eldership, but he being a part of the eldership, he can use it in singular nature, referring to himself and not the office of the eldership, but he himself is doing this. And so these three qualifications, the first being that Peter is a fellow elder, uh, and thus, being a fellow elder, he is on their same level. He knows their problems. He knows their joys. He knows the, the situations that are going to come before elders. Uh, there's the old statement about uh, walking in someone else's shoes, and you don't criticize someone until you walk a mile in their shoes and such. Well, uh, Paul, or Peter, knew the situation of elders because he was one. And so he can say, I've walked in these shoes. I've lived this way. I am one. Um, now then, of course, we don't really know where he was an elder, uh, but we know that he was an elder. Uh, we do know that he was married, as we see in 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 5. And since uh, we've already mentioned the need for uh, the qualifications that are set forth in 1 Timothy 3, verses 1 through 7, and Titus 1, verses 5 through 14, since he was an elder, he must have met those qualifications. And he was also, obviously thus, within the local congregational setting. Uh, if we look at Paul's life, uh, Paul was one who moved around a great deal. It, there wasn't uh, any long period of time that he was in one location. However, Peter, that's a different situation now. Peter, obviously, because he had become an elder in a congregation, uh, you have more of a local situation with Peter and his work. So the first qualification that he sets forth as his right to exhort these elders is that he's a fellow elder. Second, he is a witness of Christ's sufferings. Uh, this, that is, when Christ was on the cross. 
Uh, the term witness means to testify or testimony. And it would include Peter's testifying of these things. And you can go back to Acts 1 and verse 8, where Jesus tells his apostles that you're going to be witness of, uh, witnesses of me, both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Peter had done that. He had given his testimony. He had stood as a witness uh, for one uh, for Jesus Christ in testifying uh, to others concerning him. Let's also mention, in relationship to this word witness, for one to be a witness, he had to have seen the resurrected Christ. And we see that as a qualification of a witness in Luke 24, verses 46 through 48, uh, Acts 1 and verse 8 and verse 22, Acts 2 and verse 32, and also John 15 and verse 27. And so the term witness is used in a very specialized sense, specifically dealing with the apostles of Jesus Christ. Now, I know today we hear a great deal in the religious world, and sadly, sometimes, even by Christians, who will come along and say, well, we are to witness for Christ today, or that I am going to witness for Christ. Well, let me uh, clearly state, no one today has and meets the qualifications set forth in the Bible to be a witness. Now, we can and we should, as teachers of the gospel of Jesus Christ, be repeating the witness or the testimony that, they, that the witnesses gave, but we're not witnesses. They were the witnesses. Uh, and we don't qualify to be a witness today. Uh, so let's remember that in our uh, speech and make sure that we don't use the term witness in a way that's improper. The third thing that uh, Peter says in relationship to his qualifications is that he was a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. This presents us a little bit of difficulty as to what he is dealing with here. What is the uh, what does Peter mean by this term? Uh, the it possibly refers to Peter seeing the transfiguration of Christ. Uh, Matthew, the 17th chapter, Jesus takes Peter, James, and John up into a high mountain. He's transfigured before them. And on that mount of transfiguration, uh, the raiment of Christ turns white, his face is bright as uh, he sees Christ glorified. And... <clears throat> Thus, in that Mount of Transfiguration, he is, in that sense, a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Uh, so it could refer to that Transfiguration of Christ or, uh, in Matthew, the 17th chapter. Another possible way, thing that it uh, refers to is the eternal glorification in heaven. And you can notice the future tense here, the glory that shall be revealed. It's not past tense, it is future tense. Um, and uh, in, for example, uh, John 13 and uh, verse 36, uh, Jesus, uh, or Simon Peter says unto Jesus, Whither, thou go, uh, whither goest thou? And Jesus' response is, Whither I go, thou canst not follow me now, but thou shalt follow me afterwards. And so there is that aspect that uh, they're going to follow Jesus at a later date. Uh, notice also John 17, 24, and specifically stated uh, there to Peter uh, that you're going to follow me afterwards or later. Uh, but John 17, 24, Father, I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. They may behold my glory. Well, Peter very 
possibly is saying from that standpoint, I am a partaker of that glory that's going to be revealed. Uh, and in that, uh, we might go back to chapter 1 of 1 Peter, uh, and these sufferings that uh, they were undergoing brought to mind uh, the glory or the salvation, that future glory, to his mind. Notice uh, 1 Peter 1 and verse 11, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Well, he's already brought up that aspect of the glory that's going to follow. Uh, chapter 4 and uh, verse 13, uh, we again see that rejoice inasmuch as you're partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. And so the context seems to, to bring this future glory of uh, heaven's home to his mind and thus he is saying, I am a partaker of that glory that's going to be revealed by Christ. Now then, in verse 2, he tells these elders, upon giving these qualifications, feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. So now then, he's going to give certain qualifications or instructions both from a positive aspect and from a negative aspect. <clears throat> uh, first, uh, there is the positive aspect. Feed the church. The word feed is from the Greek word uh, poimion. Uh, poimion. And it means literally to tend or to shepherd. We get the word pastor from this uh, word. Uh, and so pastor the flock. Uh, the English word feed uh, really does not include all that would be involved in pastoring. Feeding includes more simply the preaching and teaching aspect. Uh, but uh, I to turn that ringer off. It won't be quite as bad. Uh, there's that uh, tending that uh, that is set forth here, which includes all of their duties, which includes the feeding, the te teaching, and preaching. But it also would include the guarding and protecting, the disciplining and other aspects of being a shepherd. Uh, so you shepherd, you tend, not just simply feed the flock, but you tend the flock, you shepherd the flock of God which is among you. Uh, <clears throat> notice, though, that it is an aspect of feeding the flock that's involved in this. You make sure that the flock is fed. Uh, their authority is, uh, or part of their authority is to make sure that the flock is taught properly, that they learn God's Word. Now then, they, of course, do not have to do all of the teaching, but they have a responsibility in relationship to everything that is taught. Uh, so while they can use an instrument to do the teaching, for example, they can have the right to hire someone to publicly proclaim the gospel. They have the right to set someone in a Bible class in the teaching aspect that they are giving to the flock. But still, ultimately, the elders are the ones who are responsible for what is taught. If I, as a preacher of the gospel, get up and preach something that's in error, the elders of this congregation are the ones who are responsible for that. Now, yes, I am too but it would be their obligation in that type of a situation to make sure that they put a stop to that teaching because they don't want improper food being fed to uh, their flock. 
Notice also that their authority does not go beyond the local congregation. Feed the flock of God which is among you. Uh, their authority resides within the local congregation, not in some other congregation. Uh, and one congregation does not have the right to oversee another congregation, or one eldership of a congregation does not have the right to oversee the individuals in another congregation, uh, but uh, they have the responsibility over their local congregation. Um, a few years ago, Alvin Jennings uh, wrote a book uh, called The Three R's of Evangelism, and then he, ca he revised it a little bit and came out with the uh, same thing and just with a different name. And basically he set forth a Catholic type of parish in which the, the one eldership would be over all of the congregations in a city. Uh, he did at least keep the aspect of it. Uh, an eldership and thus a plurality of men, but these, this plurality of men would be overall every congregation within the entire city. Uh, and as a result, uh, that uh, doctrine is false. Uh, that's the eldership is uh, have authority or has authority over their congregation not over anyone else's. Second positive aspect, they are to take the oversight. Oversight is from the Greek word episcopeo, and it means to superintend, to oversee, or to direct the affairs of something. Uh, they are to direct the affairs of the congregation. Uh, they have that oversight, and you can tie in Hebrews 13 and verse 17 along this line. Uh, uh, this word, though, also implies that they have the authority to direct the affairs of the congregation, and it also implies that the congregation must submit to their oversight. Uh, a few years back, uh, we went through a long discussion, or the church did, and some individuals coming along teaching, well, the elders don't have any authority in the local congregation. Uh, basically, that was false doctrine. Uh, there just wasn't any truth to it. And uh, they do have authority. This shows that they have authority. Uh, they appealed actually to uh, verse 3, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being examples. And they said all that the only authority that the elders have is the authority of an example. But this word, taking the oversight, episcopal, shows that they have authority to superintend the affairs of the congregation, to direct those affairs. Now then, in the direction of those affairs, uh, they are, as wise men, going to take into consideration the congregation and their desires and their wishes, but they still are the ones that are going to be the ones who have to make the ultimate decisions. They cannot make laws for God, and the, this oversight does not give them the right to make laws for God. God's laws are already established. They are revealed to us within the Bible. However, within those laws of God, there are matters of expediency. Um, a good illustration, there are several men uh, that are going overseas and do overseas work. Uh, there are several good works, uh, benevolent works, that people can give to, that congregations can support. Which one? There's only a limited amount of funds. Which one are, which missionary are we going to support? Uh, which benevolent work are we going to support? Well, the elders of the congregation are the ones that ultimately make those type of decisions. The authority is there for that work. Now then, 
there's an area of expediency as to that work, and the elders in that area of expediency make the decisions in directing the affairs of the congregation. Now then, he gives us uh, some negative instructions. They were to take the oversight, but it was not by constraint. Uh, they were to do so willingly. Uh, in other words, they are not to be forced or they are not to be compelled to do this work. But one of the problems that we face is that uh, we see one of the qualifications, in fact, maybe the first one that's being listed in 1 Timothy 3 and verse 1 is a desire to do it. Well, this ties in with not having cons not being forced to do it, doing so willingly, having the desire to do it. But it's not a desire for the preeminence. Uh, we'll see that in one individual in Third John. Uh, Diotrephes wanted to have the preeminence. He loved to have the preeminence. Well, it's not that aspect. And a desire for that power, uh, that preeminence, but it's a realization that here is a work that needs to be done, and so I am going to, and I want to, because I want to please God and I want to further his cause, I want to do everything within my power to do what is good for the church and for Christ, I'm going to be involving myself in this work. I want to do this work. And so there's that aspect of accepting the work willingly. Uh, and when we recognize it more from that aspect, that it is an acceptance of a work, then we'll have more of an understanding of that aspect of the desire, and also that we're taking this willingly and not by constraint. The next thing is it is not to be done for money's sake, but of a ready mind, not for filthy lucre. Filthy is from a Greek word, and it literally means dishonorable gain. Now, elders in New Testament times were often supported. We see that in 1 Timothy 5 and verse 17, that an elder is worthy of double honor. Uh, that is, that he, he is worthy of the honor in relationship to the work that he is doing as being an elder, but the double honor there would be he is also worthy to be paid, and thus a paid elder. Uh, but there would be the possibility, thus, that some would use their position for personal gain. And so he, Peter is uh, admonishing them, you're not to do this, you're not to get into this office for personal gain, not to fill your pockets with money. Uh, dishonorable gain, uh, but of a ready mind. A ready mind is a mind that is willing. It shows an eagerness and an earnest desire to please and to serve God. That's the aspect. Uh, if uh, an elder is paid, then fine. Maybe we even need paid elders today. In fact, I personally think it would be uh, good in relationship to the church to have paid elders many times. Uh, they can do things that a preacher uh, is called upon to do that the preacher doesn't have any uh, real uh, reason to do. He doesn't have any right to do. Uh, and we have set up with preachers many times a pastor system, whereas if we had paid elders, the elders would be involved in doing those things instead of the preacher. Um, and might be better in many regards for the church. Uh, but here they should not do it simply to get paid, to get uh, to fill their pockets with money. It should be a, an eager, earnest desire to please and to serve God. And in that, if they are paid, then fine and dandy. But uh, if not, then they're still willing to do the work. Verse 3, neither is being lords over God's heritage, but examples to the flock. They are not to be lords over the flock, but to be examples over it. They were, in other words, they were not to abuse the power that they had. 
this is the verse that uh, those who tried to attack the office uh, or the authority of elders would really use many times. There are not to be lords over the flock. Well, that is, the, being a lord over the flock uh, would be an abuse of the power that they have. Uh, some individuals, and you probably know someone along this line, uh, you give them a little bit of power, they become a tyrant. Uh, but here we also need to understand Peter is not in this arguing against elders exercising proper power or authority. He's only arguing against the abuse of it not the proper use of it. In fact, there is absolutely no way that you can abuse something that is not itself authorized. If the elders do not have authority, then there could be no such thing as being lords over God's heritage. Uh, that wouldn't be possible because the authority itself has to be authorized before they can be lords. Now then, they were to be examples to the flock, or a pattern for emulation for the flock, even as they, the elders, will emulate the chief shepherd, as we saw back in chapter 2. So we should be able to point to elders and say, you live like that individual. Uh, you do what that individual does. That's the type of attitude that we, as members of the Lord's church, should have toward the elders uh, where we work and where we uh, live, that flock that we are a part of. Look at the elders and say, you live like them, you be like them. Uh, they are worthy of emulation because they are out there being examples. They mentioned something. A lot of times elders seem to get the idea that they are uh, kind of like a board of directors that sets policy and then just passes it on to others in order to do it. That, they don't, that they're not involved in doing it themselves. The idea of examples to the flock or examples to the flock is that they're going to be out there leading the people in doing this. They are the ones who are actively engaged in the wor these works. Uh, and we need to realize that unless they're doing the work themselves, there's no way that they can be examples to the flock. Um, and so... Uh, they are the ones who have to be out there in the forefront, leading the congregation. Uh, sad to say, because of the way in which we do things today, so many times it's the preacher who's the leader. It's the preacher who has to get up all of the programs of work. He has to decide. He's the one who presents it to the congregation. He's the one who's out in the forefront, leading the congregation instead of the elders. And really, that lends itself again to this preacher being the pastor system that is wrong and sinful. The elders need to be the ones who are doing all of this. Now then, verse 4, And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Now then, the reward is being stated. When the chief shepherd, the chief shepherd is Christ, appears, they are going to receive a crown of glory that does not fade, fade away. The word appear is a word which means to, excuse, to, be, made, to be manifest. Uh, our bind defines it as to, to be manifested is to be revealed in one's true character. And here, thus, it's referring to the second coming of Christ. When he re reveals, when he appears... When he is manifested in his true character, uh, that would be in relationship from heaven, then a crown of, right, of glory that fades not away is going to be given to this elder who has done what God wants him to do. The word crown here is the Greek word stephanos, and it's a wreath that would be set upon uh, the victor's head, uh, worn by a hero or by conquerors. It's the idea that Paul speaks of in 1 Corinthians 9, verses 24 through 26. Uh, 
And here it is, a, the crown is glorious. It is of splendor. And it does not fade away thus. And that takes us back to chapter 1 and verse 4 in the aspect that this crown and our eternal life, uh, heaven itself, is Im immortal. It will not pass away. It fades not away. Verses 5 through verse 11 now, admonitions to all. He says in verse 5, Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another, and be clothed with humility, for God resisteth the proud, and giveth grace to the humble. Submission. The younger is to submit to the elder. Some think that this is still talking about the office of an elder that we see in verses 1 through verse 4, but I don't believe that that's likely here. Uh, if it were the office of an eldership, then uh, he... Uh, Peter would not have used the singular. Submit yourself unto the elder. It would have been submit yourself to the elders, plural, uh, for one thing. Uh, and then we see here elder is being used in opposition to younger. And thus it is being used from the general sense of simply one who is older. That would be the sense of 1 Timothy 5 and verse 1 as well. So he leaves the office of an eldership. Now then he's just going to deal with younger and older. Also, if it was the office of an eldership, why just the younger submit to the elders? Why not the entire congregation? Uh, so everything shows us that this is dealing with that general use of the term elder as someone who is older. The idea of submit is hupotasso, to arrange under, is the literal meaning of that. And thus it is to subordinate ourselves. This word is used, and I think we discussed it in chapter 2 and verse 13 and verse 18, and again in chapter 3 and verse 1 of 1 Peter. This would be a general attitude of younger people in relationship to older people and their wisdom and their maturity that they have. Submit one, then he says, submit one to another. Uh, Everyone is to have that attitude of submission. Uh, 1 Corinthians 5, 13 and verse 5 uh, would show that type of an attitude. It uh, is an attitude of love where we do not desire our own but uh, other man's uh, things. Uh, we are uh, what the other desires. Uh, so submit one to another. Be clothed with humility. Uh, this uh, is the enabling condition for submission, really. And then he's going to tell us the reason. Uh, so here's the enabling condition, that, and that enables me to, be, to submit one to another and to submit to those who are older. Clothe is a Greek word which means to tie with a knot. At the beginning of the Christian era, it was used of a white scarf or apron uh, which slaves wore fastened around their waist to distinguish them from free men. Uh, here, thus, he is saying, tie on humility like a slave's apron so that it will never fall off. Now then, with this on, no task will be too small or too menial for the Christian to do. Uh, Peter, no doubt, has in mind uh, when he says this, the action of Jesus in John the 13th chapter, verses 1 through 17, when he takes a towel and wraps it around himself and washes the disciples' feet. A menial, very small task that was given to the uh, lowest of slaves. Now then, Peter says, you be clothed with humility. What is it? You take that slave's apron and you tie it around you, that slave's apron of humility, and you never allow it to drop. That's the attitude you have throughout your life. And now then the reason stated, because God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. This is a quote from Proverbs 3 and verse 34 in the Septuagint translation there. Uh, we studied this uh, in James 4 and verse 6. The word resist here is a military term as an army marshaled for battle. God puts himself in battle array against the proud. He opposes their aim, their desires for self-show and self-advancement, and 
instead he um, he places uh, his um, he places his unmerited favor though upon the humble. Verse six: Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that He may exalt you in due time. So God gives grace to the humble. What is that? God's favor is upon the humble. We are to humble ourselves under his mighty hand, and he will exalt us in due time. God's hand is a mighty hand because it is an all-powerful hand. Thus, what folly to resist our God and Savior. When we humble ourselves under his hand, that's when he will exalt us. And tie in with this, Matthew 23 and verse 12 and Luke 14 verses 8 through verse 11. Then, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. When we cast our care upon him, uh, the word care is a word which means anxiety. Casting all your anxiety upon him. Anything you're anxious about, anything that would worry you, that would cause you difficulty within your mind, you cast that upon him. The word casting is from a Greek word which denotes a deposit and signifies a once-for-all act by which he forever rids himself of all of the excess worry by depositing, depositing it with God. Uh, and Matthew 6, verses 31 through verse 34 shows that. Also, uh, Psalm 55 and verse 22. You take your anxieties, you take them and put them, you deposit them with God, and it's talking about God the Father here, um, you deposit them with God the Father because our prayers are to be directed to Him and you forever rid yourself of that worry and that anxiety. Verse 8 now, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. There's an admonition now to first be sober and second to be vigilant. Sober is from the Greek word netho, which we see used in 1 Peter 1, verse 13, and chapter 4, and uh, 1 Peter 4 and verse 7, where it's translated watch. It is to be of calm mind or of serious mind, sound mindness. The word vigilant is uh, uh, the Greek word gregorio, and it means literally to be watchful. You be, you be of sound mind and you be watchful. Uh, that's what he's saying in these two terms, be sober and be vigilant. The reason now is given, because Satan is trying to destroy you. Now then, notice six things that he says about Satan trying to destroy us. Number one, Satan is our adversary. Your adversary. It's from the Greek word antidikos, and it is literally an opponent in a lawsuit. And as used here, we are in a trial our life and death. It's our trial. We are standing trial. We're going to either go into eternal life or eternal death. Satan is on one side. He's on the opposite side. He is trying to convict us of sin and thus take us to eternal death. He is our adversary in that way. He is the devil. Your adversary, the devil. The word devil is from the Greek word uh, diabolos, and it means an accuser or a slander. Here he is the one who is accusing the saints of God, and he, sl uh, he slanders them to God. So here we are uh, standing before the judgment seat of Christ, uh, to use that phraseology, and Satan is over here slandering us to God in this trial that we are having for life and death. Thus you be sober, you be watchful, you be of sound mind or watchful. He then is described as a roaring lion which shows his fierceness uh, with which he stalks the righteous. A roaring lion just walks back, back and forth, back and forth. He's just going, he's ready at all times to pounce. That's the way Satan is. He's a roaring lion. Walking about, actually, the term next, this is the fourth phrase, he is walking about, shows the restless energy that Satan has to attack the saints. 
So he's there stalking them, walking about, a restless energy. He just can't wait to jump on the saints to slander them before God and to bring them down into eternal destruction. The word seeking shows his persistence in this. He's not going to give up. He might leave for a season, but he's not going to give up. As long as we are alive in this world and of sound mind, then Satan's going to try to destroy us. And then the sixth thing, what he is trying to do is devour or eat the saints. This shows his desire to utterly destroy the saints of God. Well, our time is up for our class this uh, week. Uh, and... Uh